things up with a statement, and then we'll get to the first question. Coach. Got it. Um, hello, everybody, and um, good to see the uh, Philly locals here and, and everyone else. We are uh, obviously thrilled, like everyone, to be a part of a Final Four, and especially be here in New Orleans, um, one of my favorite Final Four towns as uh, an assistant coach and a head coach going to the coaches' conventions. Never been here as a part of a Final Four as a team, so um, we're fired up about that. Um, We've had good practices. I think we're um, starting to get comfortable without Justin. We, we miss Justin Moore. Um, he, he'll join us down here on Saturday. Um, but we are preparing for a great Kansas team um, that um, has proven themselves all season in every situation. Uh, we, 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 they're they're going to be one of the fastest um, quickest teams we've played against and, and always a, a Bill Self team is um, incredibly intelligent defensively and tough and we know we're going to have to be smart offensively against them. If you have a question for Coach Wright, please raise your hand. We'll send a microphone in your direction. State your name and media outlet before your question. Let's begin right up front in Alabama. E.P. Stedham, W.H.E.P. AM and FM, Foley, Alabama. Beautiful. Hey, Coach, uh, good to see you, and congratulations. Thank you. Coach, is there a player or two that you must stop for your team to be successful against Kansas? And can you mention a few more things that are consistent with a Bill Self team? You know, if, if you look at inside, outside, you'd have to say Abaji and, and McCormick. But the, the, the beauty of their team is you got Remy Martin coming off the bench and is as – um, high power as, as anybody right, right now, right? So you can go through any of the positions, and we, I love I love Wilson how he plays. He reminds me of like a bigger Josh Hart, which is nice unless you're playing against him. It's when you see that you're like, wow, he's like Josh Hart, but bigger, and that's pretty cool. Except we got to play against that guy, right? And um, so I mean, I, I think the the strength of their team is in their balance inside, outside. Brown, you a great shooter and 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 driver, um, and if if you talk about the consistencies of Bill's self team, I would I would have to say they they always play hard, they're always outstanding defensively, uh, they're always very intelligent, uh, and they they're great in um, after timeout situations, end of game situations. You know the sign of all well coached teams. We're going to stay on the front, in the front, on the right side. Dana first. Uh, Dana O'Neill at The Athletic. Jay, Hello, Dana. Your, your guards, you know, the way they post up, which is rel relatively unconventional, how much of an equalizer do you think that is, and particularly maybe going against a team like Kansas when you are undermanned? I mean, you know, you hope, you hope it is, Dana. You hope it's, it's something that, that can be effective. We've, we've actually um, had games, and the Houston game was one of them where we, we, we couldn't, we couldn't do it, you know, because of defensive scheme. So we do have to have other answers to that. I think we get a lot of credit for that. Um, and it's a, just a part of what we do, right? Um, we can be successful without it, but it's, it's something that, that we like to use. One of the things um, about Kansas that concerns us is, you know, if, if you look at Brown, uh, Abaji, um, those guys, and, and even Harris, they, they play with length and size. And they always have a light foot or a McCormick around the basket to protect the basket. That's, that's going to be difficult. So we, we're, we're going to have to be creative in finding ways to get our guards down there. If we can, it's going to be good for us. If we can't, we, we have to have other answers. In that same area on the third row? Coach Chris Bunnen of ESPN, Hi, when you look at Caleb's journey to – to school, through everything he's been through. What's it been like to watch his journey and get to see him in his hometown, get to be able to play in the Final Four? There's a lot of great feelings about coming to the Final Four, but that, watching and experiencing Caleb come back home and playing the best basketball of his career is, is really heartwarming for me. He, is, he has been through everything. I mean, he's got COVID twice. He had myocarditis I and mean, all the things we feared that we, you know, you test for, that you worry about young athletes getting. He got it. He was out. 
He was literally out from September to, I mean, from April to September. He couldn't do anything, nothing. Like, he, he, he couldn't even shoot free throws. And, um, and then he comes back this year and he gets COVID again. And, um, and we, he's missed so much. And to see him playing at the level he is right now and to be back home in New Orleans is awesome. What's been so impressive is I think it's his faith and his, his, um, his mental toughness. It, it never, you never saw him down. You never saw it, um, even when he was coming back from injuries and, and, and stuff. You didn't see him frustrated. It's incredible. And it's why he's in the position he is in now. And as I said, he's playing the best basketball of his career. Front row, Mike. Mike Jensen, Philadelphia Inquirer. Two-part two question, and it's about two different people. But uh, first about Malik Waynes. Uh, I, I'm curious, uh, what does it mean for you to have you know, him be at a Final Four? What is it, and, and for a former star point guard to be doing really uh, sort of menial stuff. Yeah. Uh, do you explain that to him in advance? And then the other part is, is about uh, Cosby Roundtree. Uh, have you noticed him grab a mop and do sort of Ochefu duty during a, during a timeout? <laughs> and, you know, what's, what's his role in this team yeah. and what does it mean for you? Malik Wayans uh, is, is, is a, a great story for us. It's, it's what our program's all about. Uh, he was a great player here, uh, went on, had a, a great professional career in the NBA and in Europe. And then he was one year from his degree and he came back and, and you know, he was a great student while he was here. He just, after his junior year, went to the NBA. Um, so he just had one year to complete. And he came back and uh, I just said to him, when we, when we were doing our wildcat walk before we get on the bus, you know, he and I were at the back of the line. I said, how about... I said, look at this. How about you going to a Final Four as a coach? Who would have ever thought you would have imp impacted a team as a coach? Because um, he was a little bit of a hard head as a player in a good way. It's what made him good, but he, you wouldn't have thought he was going to be a coach. And, um, but to see him come back and go to class, like he joked with me one day. He's like, I just came back from, close, from class. He's like, I'm 30 years old. I'm sitting next to Jalen Brunson's sister in class. You know? And the humility and the intelligence for him to go through that, and it's such an impact on our players because they know he's a great player. They know he played in the NBA. And he brings great wisdom every day to them. So it, it's, it is really um, a big part of our program's pride to have a guy like that coming back, finishing his degree, being a coach, impacting the team, doing all the little things he's got to do. Like, you know, you'll see him sometimes when we get off a plane – and we're getting the stuff, the bags from the plane to the bus. He's helping the managers carry the bags from the plane to the bus. And every once in a while, I'll say to our guys, like, that guy played in the NBA. Look, look at his humility. Look what he's doing for our team. And Demir Cosby Roundtree is the same way. Like, he can't, he can't go five days in a row, but he'll give us in practice um, two, three days where he can go against – Eric Dixon, and he'll take Eric Dixon all the time by himself, work with Eric Dixon, um, and he'll walk through it on the scout team. So on day of the games, our scout team, if we breakfast at 8, our scout team's down there at 7 a.m. going through the stuff. He's down there doing it, you know, as a fifth-year senior. It's amazing. He does all the little things, and he's still a great leader on this team. Next question is for Zach in the fourth row on the right. Uh, Zach Brazil of New York Post. Hey, Zach. Your uh, two guys, Caleb and uh, Colin, were asked about a one on one game they played when uh, Caleb was visiting. And, you know, I guess it, got, it was pretty competitive. And Colin, Caleb was actually up 13 0 until Colin realized, wow, this kid's pretty good. I need to, I need to come back <laughs> against him. Um, just what are your thoughts hearing that? And just, I guess, just speaks to Colin's competitive fire, I guess. Just. I, that's funny. I, I didn't know that. I could see a game, if you gave Caleb the ball first, especially at that time in his career, I could see a game where he could go up 13 nothing because he is explosive and incredible offensively. At that time when he came in, I can't see him stopping Colin in many possessions, to be honest with you. But uh, I could, it's funny to hear that because I could just picture that. I could see Colin saying, all right, this is it, you know, I got it. 
I got to win this. I got to find a way to win this. Um, his competitiveness would allow him to do that. Whether whether we get this recruit or not, he might not like me, but I'm gonna I'm gonna find a way to win. Did Colin win the game? Did he say he won the? At the, I'd like to see him do it now, because Caleb is, Caleb has learned a lot and he's bigger and stronger. Um, but that that's that's a great story. And at, about for where those guys were at that time, Caleb came in incredibly skilled offensively, not really a refined defensive player, I would say. And and Colin was a competitor and was probably thinking, I got to I got to hold up the Villanova reputation here. I can't let a guy come in from the outside and beat us. Front row on the right, Billy. Uh, Billy Witz with the New York Times. Jay, yeah. can, can you take us back to like, at what point did putting your guards in the post become a priority? And I guess over the years, how do you teach that? And how do, you, how, how do players build up the skill? What sort of work do they do? You know what, Billy? I, I, I should probably look back. In my mind, I might not be right about this, because I steal everything, and a lot of the stuff we do comes from our players. I remember that Ryan Archidiacono was good. He was good in the post. So we started posting him up. That's what I remember. We started posting him up. Um, and Jalen Bruns, so we, we saw he had a strong lower body, and he was really tough in there, and he had great footwork. So we, we started using him in there. And then we started using Josh Hart in there as a guard. And in that season, um, that was the, it was probably around 15, he started, we started to use that. Jalen came in in 16 and would go against Arch in there. And when they would go against each other, they were both pretty good. But then after Arch left and we started using Jalen more, Jalen took it to a whole nother level. How to, how to get into the post. What Jalen was posting up bigger guys. You know, sometimes if they would switch and put the five men on Jalen, he'd post them up. So then we just started <clears throat> taking all the things that Jalen and Arch did, putting them into drills, and then playing a lot of one-on-one -on -one with our guards in the post, drills, and then seeing of the guards that came in who was good at it and who wasn't, right? And now Colin got his butt kicked by Jalen in there all the time and started to get really good at it. Um, so we've, you know, over the years just found, and some guys just aren't, aren't that good at it, and that's okay. But we we've, we'd still do drills to try to teach every one of them to be good at it. Mike, you had a follow-up? <clears throat> uh, Kevin Durant question. Did he, did he text you about Justin, and can you take us through that, and did Justin get back to you about what that meant to him? Yeah. Um, he called. I can't remember. I called Sean Ford at USA Basketball to get Kevin's number. And Kevin, I texted Kevin, he called me. And Kevin said, you know, I, wa I was watching that. And it looked just like mine. I knew it when he went down, it looked just like mine. And so we talked uh, for a while about it. And what was so impressive to me was he said, I'd, I'd like to talk to him. I talked to his parents about the process. He, and he said, um, you know, I want to tell him, you know, that he listed himself, Clay Tom, Thompson, a um, couple other guys I can't remember that. He goes, look, these guys had it in the NBA, and people in the NBA know now that you can come back from that. He said, earlier, before me, when that happened to you, NBA people thought you were done. But so many people have come back from that now. He, I want him to know he's not, he's not done. And that NBA people know that too. And then, you know, we talked about the process coming back. He said, I'll explain it to him. Any time through his process he wants to use me, it, it, I'll, I'll do it for him. So I said, great. And I gave him Justin's number and he FaceTimed Justin. And they had a great talk. And Justin said it was, it was just really comforting to know and to know that he's got him as kind of an advisor on his way through this. Second row center. Dave Murphy with the Philadelphia Inquirer. Jay, does it mean anything to you to be here with Kansas, Duke, North Carolina, three of the most historic programs in, in college basketball history? Um, Jermaine was saying, you know, growing up, 
it seems like every Final Four has one of those teams in it. Um, and do you feel like you've kind of put your, your program on the track to, to be one of those teams for future generations? To answer your first question, is it, you know, do I feel anything about being here with them? Hell yeah. We have, we have great respect for them. We have great respect for their tradition, their history, and for the teams that they are right now. You know, we watch these teams. I mean, these are obviously the three best teams in the, that are playing the best basketball right now. That's what the tournament is, right? Like, we all know that. It's like, who's playing the best basketball right now? Um, and we, we never aspire to be one of those programs. As a matter of fact, we, we, we fight the urge to try to be like them because we're just so different. We just try to be the best Villanova we can be. But when people on the outside connect us to them or count us as part of their legacy and tradition, we love it because we have so much respect for them. Center of the room toward the right side. <clears throat> I coach David Lawrence with Kansas Radio. The 2018 matchup is remembered by Jayhawk fans as uh, 18 and 2018. The two uh, were draining at a record-setting pace. Obviously different cast of characters, but similarities and differences in your team this year. And, you know, it might be more difficult, but any, what's different about Bill Self's team in this matchup? I think they're, I think they're really different teams, and it's, it's funny. I, Kansas fans are um, so passionate and, I, you know, I'm not in the Big 12, so I hope I'm correct. But they seem so polite. Like, I mean, I know we've gone out there and, you know, we've played and after the game they always tell you, oh, you have a great – no, they beat you, but they tell you have a nice team, you have a really good team, good luck. But even after that, you always – I see them around and they say, like, wow, that game was amazing. We remember that game. You guys were great. In our minds, that game – I don't know if that happens so much when you come to Philadelphia. That's my – point but my recollection of that game was just it was just one of those games where we just made every, it was ridiculous like and we've been on the other side of that I remember looking down at Bill thinking I've been there it just so happened in a final four game it happened to us this year at Baylor happened to us this year at Creighton it just they just made every shot we made every shot so we don't even count that as we were just lucky that happened I, but I do think this year Really different teams. Like we're, we, we don't have the firepower that that team had. Kansas is a way faster team, and um, much more explosive, and and um, much much more perimeter oriented than, than that team. So it's almost it's almost like we're flip flopped, you know, in terms of what the teams are like. So different, but I think the things are the same. Is like Bill's teams. Um, what always impresses us is the, in, the intellect defensively and um, the execution, you know, in dead ball situations is always, you know, coaches get off on that stuff. So it's always impressive when you, when you see that stuff. You know, I don't know how much players like it, but when coaches watch another coach do it, they're like, that's, that's pretty cool. They do good stuff. All the way in the back, coach, and all the way left. Coach Ed Daniels, WGNO New Orleans. I know you play in a lot of arenas and a lot of domes. Is it extra special to come here to what we consider an iconic building to play in this venue this year? Absolutely. Um, my wife and I were talking about this morning. We're like, it looks so good. Did they did they knock it down and build another one? I was like, no. This is the this is the original man. Like this is. This is the one we see the Super Bowls in and Final Fours in, and um, it is it is really special playing here. And and like I said, I've been here as a as an assistant coach, even as a head coach at Final Fours. This is one of my favorite towns to come to at Final Four. Good restaurants, good music. You know, usually you're out of it, so you're here for a good time. But you're watching games in here, you know, and to get to play in here is really special and to say that you played here. And I'm, I, I can't tell you how thrilled I am for Caleb Daniels. He's, he's just one of my favorite people as a player because of everything he's been through. And, and, and his, he's also 3'8", 3'9", student. He's incredible. He's the most amazing kid. So for, to, for him to come back here is really special. And for us to be with him is really cool. This is probably going to have to be the final question all the way back on the right. 
Hey, Jay, Matt Tate from the Lawrence Journal World. Uh, you kind of mentioned this a little bit ago about the field here, but, but Bill said yesterday that KU Nova kind of feels like the undercard to him, and, and he said he's <laughs> great with that. Um, I wonder, does it feel that way to you, and, 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 and do you share his, uh, his joy in that? Um, you know, when you say it, I get it. Somebody else, somebody else did say that to me. Um, I, I don't, I, I'm so worried about Kansas, honest to God, honest God. What, you know, when I get out here and I, I have to answer the questions, I think about other things. I, I'm so, they're so fast. And it, what, what's really impressive about them is there's teams that, that play in transition fast. There's a lot of teams that do that. In their half-court offense, they cut so fast. I remember watching a game just on a, like a, a big Monday game or something, they were playing Texas Tech, and it was the end of the game. It was at um, – in Lawrence, and they had to get a three, and they passed and cut and passed and cut, and I was like, holy, man, I'm glad we don't have to play them. <laughs> now here we are, right? So I, I'm, I'm not into the – I don't think about that at all. I'm so into our game. We want to thank Coach Wright for joining us here in the main interview room. Coach, thank good luck. We'll see you again Bye. tomorrow. Thank you.